Bantam Press, which is an imprint that is ultimately owned by Penguin Random House, has made some very interesting decisions with regards to one of its new book releases. It revealed the cover for Forge of the High Mage, which is book four in a six book series by Ian Esselmont. And there's been some backlash. Readers were mad because of two things. First, the cover is just a bad piece of art. Even for an AI art, this looks really bad. I've seen some AI art that actually looks quite good, but this one is just awful. Seriously, the, the more you look at this cover art, the worse it gets. It gets so bad every time you look at the details. And I put this cover on Twitter a bit snootily calling it out for having just a lot of visual inconsistencies that are indicative of it being AI generated artwork, saying I thought it looked bad. And I do, and I don't feel bad saying that because I'm not insulting an artist here. I'm pretty sure I'm just insulting Mid Journey. I mean, this, this is really sloppy stuff. I don't understand how anybody who looked at this at full size for more than three seconds thought it was okay to approve. The second and arguably main reason that readers are angry is because of the publisher's decision to use AI illustrations on the book cover. Why, why use an AI art for a new Malazan book? Malazan Book of the Fallen and Malazan Empire are some of the highly praised epic fantasy. This is just embarrassing. And there's really a few things behind that emotional reaction. The, the first is, of course, the loss of income to a human artist. I think in any situation, taking a job away from an artist and trying to just put out a book with AI generated artwork isn't the best practice. There are starving artists out there that will be certainly within a range that anyone could budget for. From Steve Stone, who did such an incredible job in doing the illustrations for Path to Ascendancy, to something like this. Those of you who approve this, shame on you. The second is the question of where is all that money going instead? For especially a big established name like Malazan with a publisher who has a budget, not acceptable. And last but definitely not least is the controversy around the development and commercialization of these AI art generators. Using this type of technology to profit yourself and your own works like this is theft to a degree. You're really just skimming from a thousand different artists to then not pay someone instead a subscription service. Based on the visual consistency of the cover design for Forge of the High Mage with the previous three books in the series, combined with this Instagram post from Steve Stone talking about his experimentation with Mid Journey, there is a theory circulating around that Steve Stone might somehow still have been involved with the cover design for Forge of the High Mage. I don't think this theory has any legs to it because when you put the cover art for Forge of the High Mage up next to any of the images that Steve has tagged with Mid Journey on his Instagram, we're not even in the same artistic realm here. There is no way that the same guy who created this in Mid Journey was also the same guy responsible for this travesty. The likely fact, in my opinion, is that the cover art on Forge of the High Mage is raw output from Mid Journey, generated by somebody who has not had a lot of experience in prompt crafting, and it was subsequently composited together with all of these other stock photo elements by somebody internal to Bantam Press. And judging by the Photoshop efforts, it was probably a rush job. We have no idea what the actual truth is because there has been no official press on the matter. The news of the cover reveal was broken by a British sci-fi fantasy blogger. I honestly have no idea what the powers that be at Bantam Press were thinking because none of this makes any sense, but I did try to come up with what I thought were some plausible reasons. The first of these is scheduling. This book, originally titled The Gistle, was supposed to have come out in November of 2021. Steve Stone is a very popular and very successful artist, so it was entirely possible by the time that they had a second publication date lined up that he was just booked out and did not have the capacity to do the cover illustration. That doesn't explain why Bantam Press didn't commission another human artist to illustrate the cover though. The second plausible reason is budget. Steve Stone is a top tier artist and so his commissions are probably very expensive. However, everyone has basically dismissed this because we are talking about an imprint of Penguin Random House. Ian Esselmont has sold over a million books, and apparently the previous books in this series have also sold very well. So this move really makes no sense, especially to do it mid-series, unless Bantam Press decided to do an experiment. Or, you know, we could always just go with a combination of good old incompetence and burnout, which 
Given the current state of traditional publishing would not actually surprise me, but let's give Bantam Press the benefit of the doubt. In which case, kudos, I do have to give them credit for being willing to experiment, which is something that I have consistently criticized traditional publishers for. Also at the same time, I'm a bit like, what? Anyway, what does this actually mean for publishing? Self-published authors are split. Some have already gone all in. Others are wary and have been steering clear of AI art for various reasons. And what's fascinating to me is Bantam Press have decided to go for it nonetheless, which is very surprising to me because in the conversations I've had with legal counsel at these publishers, they tend to be quite conservative and licensing, particularly in respect of elements that are used on covers would be such a normal part of the process that I find it hard to believe that this cover was not fully vetted and cleared by a legal team or a copyright team somewhere. And it's very interesting that they have cleared it, especially when Shutterstock and Getty Images have both decided to ban AI generated art from their databases. And if they somehow didn't get clearance or somehow this was cleared in error, then the issues at traditional publishing, they're, they're worse than we thought they were. In absence of direct evidence to the contrary, let Let's assume that the processes and controls at Bantam Press are functioning correctly. And that means that the in-house counsel or whoever looks after all of the legal and copyright clearances decided that this was not a concern for them, which means they must believe that their copyright over the book cover design is sufficient without having the copyright over the cover illustration. Either that or they just don't care about having copyright over the cover illustration because let's be honest, I can't really see anybody else wanting to use this particular cover illustration. Seriously, that art is not good. And while it does appear to be extremely odd to be trying this on book four of a six book series, maybe, maybe there is a sense to their madness. This actually is the ideal opportunity to experiment with AI covers because while it looks bad from Twitter reactions online discussions and this live poll that Daniel ran on his channel, I question how representative those reactions are of the general fantasy readership or even of the Malazan readership. This is not too big of a risk. At this point, the people who are going to be buying this book, they've read at least 16 other books to date and they are committed to the story. They are going to be buying this book regardless of the cover. On top of that, you can actually compare how Forge of the High Mage performs against the three previous books in this series. My personal hunch is this is not going to hurt sales for Forge of the High Mage and in fact it might actually improve sales because we've got so many people online chatting about this book who otherwise would not have been talking about the cover reveal. And in particular, I think this might actually do wonders for Esselmont's back catalog because you've got all these people like me who have read all 10 mainline Malazan books and never actually went on to read anything else in the Malazan universe. But it is very unfortunate for Steve Stone because not only has he lost a commission for the cover art of book four, if sales play out like Bantam Press are betting that they will, he's also not going to get commissions for books five and six. That is a bummer. Other traditional publishers are going to be watching the book scan numbers for this one as well. If it performs, they're all going to be jumping in. But if the bet doesn't pay off, it's going to be really interesting to see what they decide to do for this one. Are they going to keep it because the damage is done? Will they quietly retire the sloppy cover and go back to Steve Stone or another human artist or just somebody competent with Mid Journey and get something that is not terrible? And what are they going to do with book books five and six. Are they going to admit defeat or are they going to forge on in the name of science? Either way, now that one traditional publisher has jumped in, the others aren't going to be far behind. Within two years, five years, I think the majority of book covers on normal editions at least are going to be AI illustrated covers. Human illustrated book covers are going to become a point of brand differentiation, at least on normal editions anyway. And as the technology is adopted by more and more people, I think art will become increasingly commoditized and we'll see a drop in the average price of art as well as the cost of its production. But at the same time, art as a luxury, as a premium product, as a collector's item 
is still going to be around. That's the commercial reality. And we'll probably reach the tipping point a lot sooner than we think because a tripod book going out with an AI illustrated book cover happened way faster than I thought it would. This change is really going to be felt by trad pub authors. Nobody is going to boycott Bantam Press over this. From my experience and from what I've seen, traditional publisher usually doesn't give a damn about this. They will just proceed with this one. If you're an author and you're on the traditional publishing side of things and you've been dreaming about that beautiful human illustrated cover, well, maybe you can try and get your agent to negotiate a no AI art clause into your publishing contract. But publishing contracts are kind of hard to come by, so that may not be the hill that you want your career as a published author to die on. Unless you're Brandon Sanderson, in which case you can ask for and expect to get Michael Wayland. Or unless you want to join us over here and self-publish, in which case we'd love to have you and you might want to check out the rest of my channel. Bantam Press have seriously messed up how they've handled this. If they wanted to experiment, they could have just asked Steve Stone. I mean, look at this guy's Instagram. He is clearly excited about the potential that Midjourney offers for his art and he knows how to use it well. The sloppy effort combined with no official statement creates very bad optics, especially given the current discourse and debate over the ethics in how AI art generators have been developed and commercialized. Daniel is entirely on the money when he says, You're really just skimming from a thousand different artists to then not pay someone instead a subscription service. Because because the way these AI art generators have been developed and commercialized are legally dubious at best. And in my opinion, clearly unethical. First, you had researchers being exempt from having to comply with copyright laws on the basis that they were conducting research for non-commercial and private purposes. With this exception in hand, they went off and mass downloaded copyrighted images with their text captions from the internet without the knowledge or consent of the copyright holders. Then they used these datasets to train their algorithms. First, they get the algorithm to model patterns in the image caption pairs. Then they test the model with some more images to see how accurately it can predict what the caption should be given a particular image. When it gets pretty good, they introduce a second algorithm to generate fakes good enough to fool the first algorithm into thinking that the fakes came from the real data set. Now the second algorithm starts by generating random patterns of noise. And from that point, the two algorithms just go at it. Every time one wins, the other improves based on the feedback. And eventually over many, 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 many cycles of this, you will get a generator that can produce fakes good enough to fool humans on a fairly reliable basis. At which point the researchers published their findings and made the model and the data sets available. And then other people came along and decided to commercialize the technology for profit without going back to sort out the little matter of all of these copyrighted images that were never properly licensed for commercial use in the first place. When someone types forward slash imagine Malazan cover illustration by Steve Stone, Mid Journey isn't copying over any pixels from an original artwork by Steve Stone. It's running through a model that has been trained on billions of images to regurgitate a pattern of random noise that conforms to the billions of parameters that it thinks matches the keywords in that prompt. AI hasn't truly learned by looking at the images in the data set in the same way that a human studying the work of other artists would, you know, with an eye for coherence and an understanding of the original artist's intent. All it's done is apply brute force computing to reverse engineer patterns it's identified across billions of copyrighted works by human artists and then try to impersonate them to the point where it is trying to forge artist signatures and reproduce watermarks. That's a watermark. AI is stealing stock images. It's stealing aesthetic of, of stock images. There is no way of figuring out why it's trying to do that because you can't interrogate an algorithm and ask it to explain itself to you. Many machine learning models are actually quite good at remembering data. Right? There are also traces of information from the data sets, especially the training data is encoded in the algorithm. There's also no way of stopping it because literally AI scientists do not know how to make a model forget that it's seen and been trained on a particular piece of data. If someone has trained a prediction or diagnosis algorithm that's using the data, there's some obligation to actually remove the data from the trained model. That's where it gets hairy. It's not clear how do we actually implement these deletions. The model that I returned here after my deletion operation should be the same as the model that I trained if I never had this data point in the first place. I can achieve this deletion operation by simply retraining from scratch. In most cases, for neural networks in particular, that's actually not, really not feasible. The current 
commitment to delete individual data, exact deletion, it's actually not feasible given our current algorithms. This is why the answer isn't just sue for copyright infringement or just ask for your artwork to be deleted from the data set. Once the model has been trained, it doesn't need that data set anymore. Some researchers want to train their neural network. They can actually release the full weights of the neural network on the GitHub. The data is embedded into the features and the weightings of those features in the model itself. It is literally a part of a very, very complicated equation. And nobody has any idea which parts of that equation it has affected and by how much, and no practical way to figure it out. No matter how you want to slice it, the way this technology has been developed and then commercialized is unethical. Artists' rights have been violated. And if you can't see that, let me give you a different example. Substitute sound files from Audible for their entire catalog of audiobook samples instead of images. And then consider someone typing forward slash narrate my awesome lit RPG novel dot docx by Travis Baldry. And then upload that AI narrated audiobook using a cloned voice and selling it for commercial gain without paying the real Travis Baldry a cent for using a clone of his voice. Sounds pretty sus to me. I am not a lawyer, but I would hope that a narrator, if they were caught in that situation, might be able to look to the legal precedent set by Bette Midler when she sued Ford for the unauthorized impersonation of her voice in an ad way back in the 1980s. And if the courts recognize a singer's right to control the unauthorized use of the distinctive sound of their singing, I don't see why things should be any different when it comes to unauthorized impersonations of a visual artist's distinctive visual art style. But does this mean that publishers should not be using AI art for book covers? <sighs> That's a judgment that I think every publisher has to make for themselves. The problem is not with the technology. The problem is with how this technology has been developed and then commercialized. I, I don't think we would be sitting here having this debate if all of the AI art generators out there were using models that were trained on data sets where the copyrighted images in those data sets had been properly licensed for commercial use. We'd all be rejoicing in lower cost, higher quality illustrated book covers. And the money that publishers save on getting a cheaper book cover wouldn't necessarily get pocketed as profits. It could be reallocated towards other things. Paid editing, commissions for human artists, special limited edition covers where the art matters just as much as the prose printed on the pages. More books. In the case of an indie or self-published author, in the next one, in the case of a traditional publisher, it could be an advance on a book that they would have otherwise passed on. As things currently stand, I won't be using AI-generated art in my self-publishing business. That's a choice I'm making based on my personal value values and my priorities, and it may not be a choice that is available to everyone. Regardless of where you personally stand on the ethical debate, I think there is a reputational risk to consider here from a business perspective. Bantam Press is too big for this to hurt them, but it's different for us self-published authors. And while it's nice that readers tend to be quite accommodating when it comes to production values for self-published books, I don't think we should be relying on this. I personally don't buy into the belief that the quality of a book has anything to do with the business model under which it was published. So let's not continue to give this perception any further fuel. In any case, I think Bantam Press has demonstrated that trying to fly under the radar with something like this doesn't work. Your readers might care or they might not. But I think if you're going to use AI art, then you should own that decision. Cite it and disclose it in your front or back matter, along with your prompts, in the place where you would normally credit a human cover artist. And start preparing for the day when AI-generated fiction gets good enough to put us out of business. Because that day might be coming sooner than I thought.